Welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1934's It's a Gift, directed by Norman Z. MacLeod. A good number of years ago, there was a one-time all-night broadcast on, I think it was Channel 8, and they broadcast a bunch of old movies and TV shows that I hadn't seen in years. I don't remember why it was done or even who was behind it, but it was the first time in my life I was exposed to the absolute brilliance of W.C. Fields. I believe the movie they showed was The Bank Deck, and I remember sitting there watching it with my brothers Mike and John and laughing wildly the entire time. After this, I began to seek out films, the films of W.C. Fields, but this being in the days before videotape, I had to keep a close eye on the TV guide. When Channel 8 started broadcasting 8 All Night, I not only saw other Fields films, but a lot of others I'd really like to dig up somewhere and broadcast on this show, like People Will Talk with Cary Grant. Getting back to the subject, I discovered something about W.C. Fields that I didn't know before. I always thought of him as playing a slippery con man type due to the limited exposure his movies got on television. As it turns out, although he played a character like that in four movies out of the 40 he made, he preferred playing an incredibly henpecked put-upon husband in many of his movies. And he was often paired with Kathleen Howard, who absolutely excelled at playing his nagging, sarcastic wife. The two of them are in this film, and this is one of my favorite W.C. Fields movies ever. In this film, Fields plays a grocer who dreams of one day owning an orange farm in California. His wife is a nag, his kids are brats, his assistant at the grocery store is an idiot, and he is surrounded by mean, loud, thoughtless neighbors and customers. When his Uncle Bean dies, he uses his inheritance to buy an orange grove in California sight unseen from his daughter's fiancé. The film details his life before, during, and after his adventure, and it is hysterical. I won't tell you any more for fear of spoiling the movie, but this is one of those rare occasions on Cleveland Classic Cinema where we actually present a classic movie. So stay up for this one, okay? W.C. Fields was born William Claude Dukenfield on January 29, 1880 in Darby, Pennsylvania. He was very secretive of his early life and told wild tales about being abused by his father and dropping a barn door on his head before running away to live in holes in the ground and surviving by stealing food and clothing, often being thrown in jail. This is a fairy tale, however. He discovered an interest in juggling as a boy and became an incredibly skilled juggler as well as an expert pool player. He spent his days sitting next to his mother, who unfortunately for her had a marked resemblance to her son, on the front porch of their house, listening to her to greet neighbors and then muttering insults out of the side of her mouth as they passed. Fields ended up making this a big part of his acting persona, as you'll see in this movie. When he left home, he didn't run away. His entire family saw him off at the train station, and they all cried and hugged when he left. He entered vaudeville as a juggler and had an amazing act, not only showing off his juggling skills, but also working his pool expertise into the act as well. His costume was that of a gentleman tramp wearing a shabby top hat and tuxedo. He worked as a silent comedian for a number of years, thinking that if he kept silent, it would be easier for him to play internationally. Once, while doing his act, a girl wearing a riding habit, who was the eye candy in the acts, stepped on stage but forgot a prop. She quickly ducked back off stage to get it, then came back out, snapped her fingers in frustration, and darted off stage again. Annoyed, Fields said out of the side of his mouth, she must have forgotten her horse, and the audience howled with laughter. After this, he added patter to his act and became a comedian as well. In 1900, he married a chorus girl he met on the road, Harriet Hattie Hughes, who became part of his act. When she became pregnant, he sent her home to her parents, feeling that the road wasn't a place for a pregnant woman. His son, William Claude Fields Jr., was born on July 28, 1904. Although an avowed atheist, he consented to Hattie's wish for his son to being baptized. Hattie began pressing him to leave show business to get respectable work, but Fields refused. This led to their estrangement, and they separated in 1907. He kept up a correspondence with her and voluntarily paid child support. 
He had another son, William Rexford Fields Morris, with a girlfriend, Bessie Poole, whom he met while appearing in the Ziegfeld Follies. She was killed in a bar fight a few years after giving birth to her son, and he was given over to foster care, where he picked up the name Morris. Fields also supported his second son voluntarily. He appeared in the Ziegfeld Follies for six years and went on to a stage career as an actor, appearing in the Broadway musical Poppy, which led to his being cast in the movie version by D.W. Griffith. His first short was 1915's Pool Sharks, and in 1925, he moved to Paramount, appearing in W.D. Griffith's 1925 film, Sally of the Sawdust, wearing a phony brush mustache. After that, he started 1926's It's the Old Army Game, the first movie he wrote as well as acted in, and alternated making shorts and features. After this, he went to work for producer-director Max Sennett and continued making shorts of his vaudeville skits, including 1930's The Golf Specialist, 1932's The Dentist, and 1933's The Fatal Glass of Beer and The Pharmacist. He also starred in 1932's Million Dollar Legs, a movie I would absolutely kill to get on this show. I only saw it once, and it was one of the funniest, most insane movies I ever saw. While at Paramount, he met producer William LeBaron, who ended up producing the rest of his movies from that point on. Fields trusted LeBaron, feeling he was the only producer he ever worked with who understood his style of comedy. He often drove his actors crazy, ad-libbing during, during his performances and insisting on inserting his old vaudeville acts into the movies. This is a good thing, since his movies are the only places you can see his amazing pool and juggling acts. The only movie he ever made where he actually followed the script word for word was when he played Mr. Micawber in 1935's David Copperfield, and that was because he worshipped Charles Dickens. Although the stories about Fields hating children and being a general misanthrope or legion, they are not true. Fields delighted in making up stories about himself and his life, deliberately misleading journalists just for the sport of it. Ronald Leroy Overacker, a.k.a. Baby Leroy, remembered Fields being a very kind, loving man who often played with him off-screen during breaks in filming. There was a scene in 1934's The Old Fashioned Way where, after tormenting Fields at the dinner table, Baby Leroy gets a little kick in the pants, but as Fields pointed out later, what man hasn't wanted to give a kid a kick in the pants at least once? It's obvious in the scene that Baby Leroy didn't get hurt, and because of the very outrageousness of the act, it's very funny. The stories about Fields' fondness for liquor are quite true, however. Although he never drank during his vaudeville days, he wouldn't even touch coffee at that time, fearing the effect it would have on his reflexes while juggling. He kept, the bottles, he kept a couple of bottles in his dressing room in order to attract other performers to combat the loneliness he suffered while on the road. Once he left the stage, however, he developed a fondness for alcohol that remained with him until the end of his days. He was a member of the infamous Hollywood Hellfire Club, also known as the Bundy Road Boys, whose other members, John Barrymore, John Carradine, Errol Flynn, Gene Fowler, Jack LaRue, Ben Hecht, Roland Young, Anthony Quinn and John Decker would get together and party long into the night at the Bundy Drive home and studio of John Decker. They would pl play pranks like making forgeries of famous paintings and hanging them in galleries. Decker, who was an amazingly gifted painter, would execute copies of the master's paintings and substitute the heads of friends and fellow Hellfire Club members on the subjects. I could do 20 minutes on the Hellfire Club itself, but this is about tonight's movie, so I must move along. If you're interested in finding out more about this subject, I would refer you to the book Hollywood's Hellfire Club, The Misadventures of John Barrymore, W.C. Fields, Errol Flynn, and the Bundy Street Boys by Gregory William Mack with Charles Hurd and Bill Nelson. After being struck with delirium tremens and spending a bit of time in a sanitarium, which today is euphemistically called rehab, Fields returned to the public eye via radio, appearing on Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy's radio show wherein he had a famous running feud with the ventriloquist dummy. Paramount dropped his contract when he went into rehab, and after Fields regained his popularity via the radio, Universal took him on. He did four features with Universal, who dropped him after 1941's Never Give a Sucker an Even Break. He made cameo appearances in a number of films after that, eventually retiring and reconciling with Hattie as an estranged wife, and lived out his life happily playing with his grandchildren. After being hospitalized for an alcohol-related stomach hemorrhage, his good friend, writer Gene Fowler, went to visit him and found him reading a Bible. Fowler, shocked that Fields was reading the good book, said, Bill, what the hell are you doing reading a Bible? 
Fields looked over at him and replied, looking for loopholes. He slipped into a coma soon after that, and on Christmas Day, 1946, he awoke, smiled at his nurse, put a finger to his lips, and died. He was 66 years old. Kathleen Howard was born on July 27, 1884, in Clifton, Ontario, Canada. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of biographical information about her available, but she's so good in this movie, I had to say something about her here, so here goes. Raised in Buffalo, New York, she became an opera singer and created the role of Zita in Buccini's Gianni Sicci at the Metropolitan Opera in 1918. She moved into acting while continuing her opera career and is best remembered for her roles as the wife in this movie and another W.C. Fields film, The Man on the Flying Trapeze. I didn't know much about her before I wrote this intro, but I figured she had to be at least a stage actress, judging from her diction. She's a wonderful actress, and her performance in this movie is excellent, and hearing her snap at feels never fails to make me laugh out loud. Katherine Howard died on April 15, 1956, in Hollywood, California. It's a Gift is a very funny movie, and it's full of great scenes. One of my favorites is when Mr. Muckle, the blind man, pays a visit to Fields' grocery store. But there's, there's much more to it than that, just that. I mean, all the characters, all of the characters, the supporting characters included, are brilliant. The scene on the back porch is a classic. The trip to California. I, even the scene of him trying to do something as simple as shaving in the morning is incredibly funny. I hope watching this film will spark interest in my viewers to seek out more films by W.C. Fields because they never disappoint. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy It's a Gift, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs>